I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's council meeting. It's always nice to see people other than staff. <laughs> the first item on the agenda is the consent agenda, which is a listing uh, of a group of items to be acted upon with a single motion and vote. It's designed to expedite the uh, handling of limited routine matters by city council. I will ask if a citizen or council member wishes to have any specific item removed from the consent agenda. Uh, <laughs> for discussion, and at that time, either the public or council member may request an item be removed prior to council's vote. The items on tonight's consent agenda include approval of the work session and regular meeting minutes of September the 11th, 2018, approval of the expenditure vouchers of September the 25th, 2018, approval of a renewal tavern liquor license for Cortez Veterans, Inc., approval of a renewal tavern liquor license for Purple Sage Rib Company, a, a approval of an alternative to the premises uh, for Walmart um, to alter their uh, premises for 3-2 uh, beer liquor license. So at this time, is there anybody in the audience or anybody on council that wants to remove any item? I do not. Okay. In that case, may I have a vote? Uh, Honorable Mayor, I make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. With the addition of seventy thousand one hundred and thirty dollars seventy one cents. Second. Lucero. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Keel. Aye. Betts. Aye. Noyes. Aye. Levy. Aye. Cheek. Aye. All right. Presentations. Um, at this time, uh, a council will be looking at uh, an Indigenous Peoples Day proclamation. Um, for the purpose of recognizing the second Monday in October as Indigenous People Day in the city of Cortez. Um, I'd like to read this proclamation and then when I'm finished, um, I'd like to have Kent Walker um, say a few words because actually what I'll be reading are mostly Kent's words. So, proclamation for recognizing the second Monday in October as Indigenous Peoples Day in the city of Cortez, Colorado to celebrate the enduring culture and traditions of all Native peoples within the United States and indigenous people across the Americas. Whereas the city of Cortez is neighbor to the Ute Mountain Ute Nation and is situated near the Southern Ute, Navajo and Hickory Apache Nations in Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona and Utah, in addition to being near historical Native sites preserved at Mesa Verde National Park and the Ute Mountain Tribal Park, Canyon of the Ancients, Hoban Week and Chim Chimney Rock, national monuments, as well as the sacred Navajo sites of Mount Hesperus and Ship Rock. And whereas the city council acknowledges that this community was built upon the homelands of indigenous peoples of this region, and whereas the city council wishes to commemorate the survival and renewal of native cultures in the face of political and cultural repression, and through this action, lay the groundwork for the diverse cultures of our community to work together, and whereas the City Council recognizes that Indigenous Peoples Day shall be a platform to celebrate the thriving culture and value that the Ute, Navajo, and other Indigenous peoples add to the City of Cortez. And whereas the City Council recognizes the importance of diversity within the community and encourages other businesses, organizations, and public entities to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day, therefore be it resolved by the City Council of the City of Cortez, Colorado, that the second Monday of October shall be known as Indigenous Peoples Day in the city of Cortez to celebrate the contributions and the enduring culture and traditions of all Native peoples within the United States and Indigenous peoples across the Americas uh, on this 25th day of September 2018. Do we need to take a vote on this, Linda, before we go any farther? Okay. In that case, Ken, would you like to share a few thoughts? Sure. This one live? Uh huh. Uh, my name is Ken Walker, and um, a little over five years ago, I was living in Estes Park, and I decided at that time 
to go back to school. Um, I attended Colorado Mountain College and earned an associate degree in resort management. But I got a lot out of the process of just learning and being back in school, and so I decided to continue my education and exploring what I wanted to study. I came across the Native American and Indigenous Studies program at Fort Lewis College. So my wife and I moved to Durango. That's what eventually led me to Cortez because it had stirred, uh, that program had stirred an interest in me that I had had years ago. In my studies at Fort Lewis, I wondered why people, U.S. citizens, knew so little about our full history and how it has shaped the present. Thomas Jefferson spoke about the importance of knowing and judging the past because if we don't know our history, we can't learn from it to make a better tomorrow. Instead, we just keep recycling the same errors. For example, why does the city keep minutes on these city council meetings to help remember what took place, what was said, what needs to be done, and then to build on that? Without those records, I imagine your job would be a lot more difficult. This meeting opened with the Pledge of Allegiance. So I'm working to better understand America's past, sort of like the minutes of our history, so that we can build on what has worked with liberty and justice for all and improve on what has not. So recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day, which now over 60 communities have done, can better serve to open an understanding of our history and the lands that we live on. So I wanted to thank you for considering this important resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have signed this. Would you would you would you like to have this? Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Before we go any farther, we're having some technical difficulties. We usually put the agenda up on the television screen over here. If you'd like to have an agenda there in the little um, uh, dispensary there at the door. So you can pick one up and see what's going to happen. It's like a program guy. All right. Uh, at this time, uh, we have the opportunity for citizen participation, and I understand that we have several Several people here are artists that, uh, several artists whose work is now on display here in City Council um, are here. And so, Sonia, would you like to? Okay, then. <laughs> then in that case. Hello, I am Karen Kristen and I'm one of your local artists. I've been here in residence while well, I bought my studio on Sligo Street, the Sky Art Studio in 2001, and I have uh, moved here full-time from Denver in 2005, and I just want to say that this particular community, <coughs> uh, Cortez, has inspired a lot of uh, creative expression for me, and I am uh, really honored to see my piece Winslow, Arizona, on the wall behind you. Um, just a few words. Um, I'm what you call a cradle artist. I started very, very young and have always worked in art and made my living as an artist. Uh, primarily, my major accomplishments have been in studio artwork such as these and also in very large scale architectural space, sky ceilings. And I have a number of those in Las Vegas the um, Venetian Grand Canal Shops uh, has 105,000 square feet of my sky art. And the Forum Shops at Caesars has 92,000 
square feet of my skies, and then we add it on, and they now have about 175,000 square feet. So through the years, this has been a great career. I have traveled widely across the United States making art in shopping malls and casinos, interestingly, <laughs> and um, have worked internationally as well, and uh, always come home here now to Cortez. So I want to explain a little bit about Winslow, Arizona. That is a piece that I painted in 1992. So it's quite a, uh, it's got quite an old history to it. Um, in the early years when I moved from Los Angeles, which was my hometown, to Albuquerque, New Mexico, I traveled extensively between New Mexico and Los Angeles, traveling the I-40 and always photographing, taking pictures, and being inspired by the beautiful landscapes and skies that I saw there. So this particular piece came out of the, those years and that experience. Um, uh, let's see, we'll get on down here to the, to the thank yous that I want to do. I first of all want to um, welcome the new city manager, John Doherty, and um, Thank you for being in favor of the arts. We all appreciate that. I want to um, especially uh, thank Sonia Hiroshko for her continuous work in all of the arts and the fine job that she does and everything she takes on. She's made a big difference here in this community, so my thanks to you, Sonia. Um, further, Eric Ikkenu, I hope I, I pronounced that correctly. I, 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 I want to thank you for your <laughs> long uh, trials and <laughs> experiences working to get the Arts Commission organized with Sonia. We appreciate that very much. Um, I would like to thank the whole City Council as a group for supporting this effort. I think it will make Cortez a much more visitable community than it is now, and if we can see more murals and more art everywhere, I think that would be a wonderful thing. I want to especially thank Linda Smith for her untiring work getting all this together for, as Sonia says, picking up the pieces and putting things back together again. So thank you. And Chris Burkett, I'd just like to mention him, now retired for his interest in, um, in the arts and for also for welcoming John Doherty into the city council. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Barbara Grist, and I live in Cortez, Colorado, and came here in 1981 to teach school at the middle school. So my, uh, most of my teaching career was there, um, shaping young minds like Ty Keel. <laughs> but, um, she did a good job. Anyway, I loved my uh, teaching career, but I was also an artist um, uh, all the way through. Two, I still, uh, I am retired now and um, still love teaching um, people of all ages. Um, I teach with the Road Scholar program uh, through Kelly Place and uh, I'm going in to teach some third graders on Thursday <laughs> some uh, about Johnny Appleseed paintings and stuff. So I love teaching still, I still love creating work and um, I want to also thank all the people that Karen mentioned, um, again, for your support of the arts. Uh, it's been uh, a long process getting this to happen to where we walk in here and we see our work on the wall. Um, very grateful for, um, for the process, all the people that had, um, had a part in that, and um, the fact that you think that art is important and the art economy is important. So really grateful. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about my piece. It's the photograph um, on the wall with the blue water and the sandstone. It's, it was uh, created at Lake Powell one evening as the light was getting soft and beautiful. and instead of looking at the cliffs and uh, uh, around me, I was fascinated by the water. Uh, I love water and um, I just, the reflections that night just showed the blue sky that we love so much and then the, the sandstone of the cliffs. So how many of you have been to Lake Powell before? Yeah. 
a lot of people have, so it's kind of dear to our hearts. But we all, water is very important to all of us, too. Um, I printed it on metal. It's a dye sublimation process where they infuse the photograph into the metal, and it um, makes it more archival, so it'll last longer than any of us will last. Um, and then it kind of keeps that reflective quality of the water. So I hope that you continue to enjoy that. Um, I hope that, that this has brought some awareness to all of you about um, the importance of the arts and that in, in your own life you will continue to support them and also as a city. But I'm very grateful to be one of the recent artists that you purchased work from. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Barb, and thank you, Karen. And the two other artists that were, uh, 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 their work was acquired this year was Keith Hutchison, whose oil painting is in um, our city manager's conference room, and it's a seashore, dissipation of water into the air, and uh, Jan Hiles' piece, who is, her piece is hanging over there. It's the first one with the black frame that's the pastel of sunshine and Wilson Peaks up in the La Plata's. I also have a piece in it, but it was acquired in 2003. I believe that was the year by Cheryl Baker when she was the mayor, and that's in the white frame there. It's from Hovenweep when I lived there for 12 months as artist in residence, and it's simply a study from the bottom of the canyon looking up at Stronghold House. And then the one on the far right is really interesting. It's Dr. Um, John Ellis, I can't remember, Wagner, Wagner. And he um, was unknown to all of us really until John Peters Campbell did the art survey earlier in the summer and found out that he really was a professor of art history, of uh, fine arts at the University of Colorado and did a lot of historical painting in the Southwest and in Colorado, and he's very well known, but not uh, extensively collected. So we really do have one of a kind, and he was, his work was hanging in here with mine, and to put them all together in one place with Engelhardt's work uh, was really a wonderful process, and, and all of the ones this year represent a form of water, either in snowpack and melting, uh, down into Lake Powell or um, into the color of water, the dissipation of water, and then into the sky and the traveling of water and clouds back to our country. Uh, it's a reflection of the drought at this time in our area. And as John Peters Campbell said, an art collection of any city, or any municipal collection ought to reflect the time and place of the people. And he feels we have a very strong collection in the library, in City Hall, and in the Recreation Center. And I really thank the City Hall for the support you've given, I mean City Council for the support you've given to this project, and we've made some traction, cleaned up the house a little bit, and so hopefully we'll have really good projects next year for you. Anyway, thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Lori, would you like to share some things? Hi, thank you everyone. Thank you, City Council. Um, I'm here because um, I was standing at this podium in January of this year asking for the City Council to approve a conditional use permit for a Southwest Farm Fresh Cooperative and the Good Samaritan to move into a warehouse that we fondly call the Pink Building at Beach and North Streets. Um, I'm happy to say that um, this week the drywall was taped and textured and we're just a few weeks away from moving in. So thank you for your support back in the winter um, and those two organizations are really, really excited to get into their new digs right in the heart of Cortez. Um, so I, I want to say that um, there's a lot that's happened since then on related fronts around um, what we're calling the food hub. So the food hub is the section of the warehouse right next to where Southwest Farm Fresh and the Good Samaritan are. It's 4,000 square feet. It's now a virtually empty warehouse, a little bit of storage. And um, 
It has plans to become transformed into a food hub. Um, those of you who might not be familiar with that term, a food hub is a place where food can be aggregated, sorted, processed, sent back out into the community via farmer's markets through what we're calling the spokes. Now the spokes are uh, several organizations in our area who are all nonprofits and who all deal with food and security issues in our population. So by collaborating together, we can avoid the overlapping of services that was happening in our community and really build upon the strengths of each of the organizations and the individuals who are working so hard on this problem. So the Food Hub will incorporate facilities that all of these different organizations can utilize because right now there is no place. If there's a gleaning project happening or there's a glut of apples like we have this year, there's no place to take them and do something with them, even if it means just taking a whole bunch of boxes and putting them in different boxes and sending them back out to soup kitchens and food pantries and schools and the senior center and the kindergartens. So places where people don't have ready access to fresh local food can have fresh local food. Um, it really builds upon the strengths of our farming community. There are ties being made between Laplatte County and Montezuma County with food going back and forth to the people who need it. So there's a lot of exciting things happening there in the food aggregation and distribution arena. But then also important is a commercial kitchen, a place where, for example, kids who <coughs> grow products in their Montezuma School to Farm gardens don't have any place to take it to, to do something with it, whether they want to turn it into a couple jars of salsa to take home, or learn how to maybe prep it to make a stir fry. So there's no place for those kids to take the food that they grow and do something with it. So a commercial kitchen would provide an access for these kids, as well as classes, a lot of education opportunities. Cooking Matters is really active in our community, and they don't have a, a permanent place to, to teach classes from. So that's another aspect. An information center on food and farming and local culture will be incorporated as well. So it's a place where people can come and get information about anything that's happening, whether they need labor on their farm, they need someone who knows how to work in an orchard, or they just want to know the best place to go to eat. So there's going to be a lot of resources for everyone in the Food Hub, which is one thing that we're especially excited about is it's not just for one segment of the population, it's for everyone. Um, it's a long process, it's gonna be expensive. This fall we're embarking on a lot of fundraising efforts in a lot of different areas. And um, one thing that I wanna um, make sure to thank you guys for is um, approving a grant for the mural project, which is on the exterior walls of the food hub to pay the artists who are all involved. And I brought just a little, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to be by the building lately, mm -hmm. but um, we're about, maybe we just a little less than halfway through, <coughs> it's a that is, how many feet of sidewalk space? It's probably about 200 feet of sidewalk, if you measure it that way, on a 20 foot tall building. So it's gonna be a good size, good size mural. And one of the things that is extra special about this project is it's a collaborative process, just like the whole rest of the Food Hub is a collaborative process. We have seven professional artists virtually contributing their time. And we have, uh, last count it was eight, but let's just call it a pack of middle school students who are learning from professional artists how to do a mural properly from start to finish. So we are three weekends in every Saturday for probably the next couple of weeks. If you want to swing by in the morning, you can see the mural happening. So it's a really neat process. Um, related to that, in um, September 12th, we invited the mural artists to exhibit some of their artwork, framed artwork, um, inside the warehouse space to be a backdrop for a tour of funders, potential funders, from Rural Philanthropy Days. 
So that's something that's been on our radar for a while now. We're really hoping that we have some good outcomes from, from the RPD visit. I think they were pretty impressed um, with what they see happening there and with the town in general. So um, that's one thing that's been happening. We also, over the summer, um, we've had um, Southwest Farm Fresh Opinion Project and the Mangus Food Share collaborating to provide local food for kids' lunches who wouldn't have otherwise had a lunch because school wasn't in session. So um, as you can imagine, the kids who um, qualify for free and reduced lunch, when summer comes, you know, they're pretty much out of luck. So we were happy to be able to support those two efforts in Cortez and in Mancus. We also helped fund the Good Samaritan Milk and Cereal Program, another program that happens during the summertime for the very same reason. Um, we are also connecting food that is gleaned by the Good Food Collective out of Durango. Um, where, like I mentioned before, food is traveling back and forth between the companies gleaning from farms, from backyards, from home gardens. Um, surplus food is brought to one location and then sent out into the community. And um, organizations like Good Samaritan and our local soup kitchens are really appreciative of all the efforts that are happening there. Um, I think that's probably about it. I'd be happy to answer questions about the project. It's big and there's a lot to it, um, but I just want you to know that um, support for the Southwest Farm Fresh Cooperative and Good Samaritan Spaces in the Warehouse um, are leading to other really great things. So, if, if people want to volunteer um, to help out uh, once it's up and running completely with moving produce or product from the, the store to the cars or whatever, who would they, who would they get in touch with? I'm the project manager. Okay. So that and, be and down there, though? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. Yeah, because if there really needed to be a person who was kind of like the, the point person for all these different organizations because they have been working independently for many years. And so just simply introducing them, finding out what their strengths and their needs are, um, really requires somebody just to be available to collect information and make sure it gets out to the right people. Okay. So, yeah, Thank you. that would be me. <laughs> there, there, there is a definite need for volunteers. I, oh, I, yes. I volunteer at the Good Samaritan Food Bank, you know, and, and we're always short-handed, you know, you know. We have to juggle shifts every now and then. Someone goes on vacation, we have to get somebody to cover that shift, and we're always short-handed. So exactly. Just contact Lori if you, if you and, want to volunteer. Unfortunately, it's a problem that's not going to go away, and it's probably going to get worse. And so I feel like an entity like a food hub in a community like this, where we already have a really rich history of farming and taking care of ourselves, can be um, hugely beneficial you know, to the whole community in terms of starting to provide some economic stability. I mean, a heck, a lot of our farmers qualify for food stamps. I mean, it's crazy. So, you know, I think the Band-Aid solution, while it's great and important and necessary in the short term, what we really want to be doing is teaching people about food, growing food, cooking food, eating good food, you know, things that will result in, you know, better health for our whole community. So, hopefully, lots of volunteers at the beginning, not so many, ultimately. Anybody else have any questions for me? Anyone else? Thank you thank so you. much for thank coming, Lori. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate having the update. All right. Is there any other citizen that would like to address council? You'll have one more chance tonight. Mr. Braun, did you want to say anything? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Barb and Karen. My name is Ken Braun. I live at 501 South Madison. This is in regard to a 10 foot access that goes off of Madison Street to Manal. And uh, the wife and I have been taking care of that piece of property there uh, 
we've been there 30 years. And the problem is it's, it's uh, used by transits. It's, we're cleaning up after that thing constantly. My fence is getting tagged all the time, which, uh, you know, I, we clean it and all the time. And, and I'm trying to plead with the city to give me a hand on this in whatever way they can. I have some suggestions. I submitted a letter and uh, to the city planning and also to the city council and uh, in regard to this and uh, Ernie, Ernie Mains, yeah, Mains. Uh, he's the one that suggested coming and seeing you guys and seeing if I can get some help. But uh, there's needles in there, syringes, uh, beer cans, whiskey, uh, you name it, even human feces, it's terrible. And uh, I have pictures here, if you like, I could pass it down the road. Uh, of the weeds that are tall like this, I go through, I clean it all up. I've even gone through there in the wintertime with, I got a rhino, or I had, and it had a snow plow, and I'd clean that out so the kids could walk from Madison Street to the school. But it's kind of dangerous for them kids to walk to that school uh, with all that going on there. I even have the neighbors, which is the apartment building next door, duplexes, throw their food over the fence line into that area uh, from cooking and stuff. And uh, like I said, it's just terrible. And any kind of help I can get, I mean, I have some suggestions. If the city wants to vacate that property, since I'm taking care of it, you know, let me have that 10 foot and eliminate that access there from the street to the school there you know cap it off each end leave it vacant i don't care i mean work with me um that's all i'm asking mr johnson who's the director of public works um is is going to take a look at the property i know the planning and zoning um is is kind of looking at it too so if you want to contact either one of them and visit with them specifically but they'll they, it's on their radar now. Okay. And, and they'll take a look at it and see. And then who do I need to go see? Pardon? You said I need to go see somebody? Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson. Oh, He'll okay. give you a card. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Appreciate and we appreciate you coming and, and, and sharing your concern with us. All right. Well, just want to keep the kids safe. Warm. Sure. Thank we appreciate you. that. Thank, thank you. you. And, and thank you for your efforts on the graffiti as well. I understand that that's got an issue for you too. So you're, you're getting a double whammy there. All right, is there anybody else that would like to address council? All right, in that case, we're going to go to a public hearing. Resolution 19 series 2018, the establishment of oversized accessory structure NEVA. So the city's received an application from Justin and Kendra Gap for a conditional use permit to construct an oversized garage on a property located at 1008 Alma Avenue within the Manufactured Housing District. The property is a large lot um, consisting of lots 9 through 12 in Block 2 of the 20 Mule Team subdivision. And it's located right on the corner, the southeast corner of Jackson and Alma Avenue. Um, the applicants are proposing to install a 1,200 square foot garage on the southern portion of their property. Um, so if you look at the aerial up here, if you can see my little arrow. Is, there's nothing moving up there. Well, anyways, it's right on the south there, and I'll show you a site plan in a bit. Um, our land use code allows for accessory structures up to 800 square feet, or 33% of the main dwelling, which in this case would be 743 square feet, um, the applicant is going through a conditional use permit to be granted an oversized garage. Um, the existing home in the attached garage with the storage shed total 2,538 square feet. The lot size is 13,750 square feet. If the oversized structure were approved, um, the total lot coverage would come to 27%, which is below the 50% maximum lot coverage allowed in this zoning district. Um, there's no proposed water or sewer tap hookups. Uh, the applicants indicate it's uh, just for personal storage. 
Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission appro recommended approval of this CUP on their meeting earlier this month. The garage will meet all of the uh, manufactured housing district setbacks. Um, uh, and it does meet all of our conditional use um, criteria. It did get sent out for agency review and there were no substantial comments on that. And, um, Council does have several alternatives uh, for this project. It does meet the conditional use criteria. Staff does recommend approval with four conditions. Are there any questions, Council? I don't have any. Have there been any objections from neighbors about the proposed garage? No, for both this hearing and the PNZ public hearing, neighbors within 300 feet of this property were sent uh, notices that this project was occurring and I have not um, heard from any neighbor okay. here. Are, are the gaps here in the room? Yes. Would you like to address council? Thank you for your consideration. Okay. <clears throat> well, then I'll open it for public hearing. Is there anybody that would like to speak for or against this conditional use permit? All right. I'd like to make a motion. Close the close the public hearing. If there are no other questions, comments. Make a motion to approve resolution number 19, series 2018, Con approving a conditional use permit to establish an oversized structure on a property located at 1008 Alma Avenue, and submitted by Justin and Kendra Gap. I second that. Noise. Aye. Keel. Aye. Betts. Aye. Levy. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Lucero. Aye. Chief. Aye. You're good to go. All right. Welcome. We have no unfinished business or new business. Request for proposal uh, results for preliminary engineering report for water, water system improvements. Uh, Phil. Um, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, good evening. Um, we're bringing the uh, efforts we've been talking about for the last year or so about getting a preliminary engineering report on our entire water system, which is going to help us uh, develop a roadmap for that enterprise into the near future. The City of Cortez is seeking an engineering consultant to prepare a preliminary engineering report, or PER, for water systems. The PER will assess the operations, infrastructure, and management of the city's entire water system into a single planning document to guide future operations and development. The outcome of this report is to fully analyze the available options, come up with a recommended alternative, and place the city in a position to obtain funding for design and construction of the recommended water facilities. In carrying out this task order, the consultant will provide a report according to the USDA RUS Bolton 1780-2. Um, and basically, uh, this is a pretty, it's a rigorous uh, format, so even if, um, you know, we decided not to go the USDA route. Since it's the most stringent, we could apply it for, um, you know, state funding, uh, revolve, state revolving fund kind of stuff. We could just reformat it, but this is the most rigorous, the USDA Rural Utility Service. And that uh, incorporates project planning, existing facilities, need for the project, alternatives considered, selection of an alternative, proposed project, and conclusions and recommendations. So, the city's engineering division recently sent out an RFP for services related to this uh, PER. Uh, the desired contract term is approximately six months from October of this year through March of 2019. The RFP was prepared and sent to engineering firms in the Four Corners area, advertised in the Durango Herald and on the, Cor and on the Cortez Journal, put on the city's website and listed on BidNet. Proposals were due at 3.30 p.m. on Tuesday, September 4th and seven firms, with seven firms responding. FEI engineers out of Durango, Colorado, in the amount of $47,857. Harris Water Engineering out of Durango, in the amount of $60,000. Jones and DeMille Engineering out of Monticello, Utah, in $98,500. SGM Incorporated, Glenwood Springs, Colorado, $76,927. RG and Associates, Wheat Ridge, Colorado, $28,575. Souter Milliner Associates from Farmington, New Mexico, in the amount of 65,786. TRC Environmental Corps uh, out of Durango, in the amount of 84,422. 
Funds for this project were included in the 2018 Water Enterprise Capital Improvement Fund. In their response, the firms presented example PERs, their qualified personnel, a project approach to complete the tasks requested by the city. Each submission was reviewed on the firm's project experience, examples of the work approach, and overall cost for project completion. Now, before I go into the recommendation, you notice there was a fairly large spread from 28 uh, all the way up to 98. So, when, when, and there was a, a, a group in the middle, and when I get, uh, you know, some, a, a spread this large, we look at all of them, but generally the low and the highs that are so, that when they have a, a middle that is so aggregated, though I consider those outliers. You know, I just like, but, uh, Eric mentioned that actually at the work session today, you know, what are we really going to get for that 28000 versus why do we have to spend 98000 when there are four in the middle or five in the middle that can give us the same product. So having said that, uh, staff removed, reviewed all the submitted proposals and, recommend, and recommends that FEI engineers out of Durango be hired as the PER Water Systems Improvement <coughs> Engineering Firm at a bid price of $47,857. Staff has worked with the principals of FEI in the past and is familiar with their work, work ethic and dedication to completing a professional product. A professional services contract is attached for your review. Um, and in that uh, contract, there were exhibits. One was the scope of work, their cover letter for their proposal, the scope of work that was pulled out of that proposal, as well as their uh, cost. If council agrees with the staff's recommendation, council can make the motion to enter into a professional services contract with FEI Engineers Incorporated for the PER for water system improvements in the amount of $47,857. All right, Council. Questions? No, he answered mine, but the widespread on the estimates. That was quite a bit of <laughs> big yeah. difference. Uh, no, very thorough. I have many. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, may I have a motion, please? Honorable Mayor, I make a motion to enter into professional services contract with FEI Engineers Incorporated for the PER for water system improvements in the amount of $47,857. Second. Betts? Aye. Noyes? Aye. Lucero? Aye. Carlson? Aye. Levy? Aye. Keel? Aye. She? Aye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. All right. Uh, Eric, the library facilities master plan. All right, thank you, Council. Um, I'll kind of give you, Phil does such a good job reading his RFPs, it's so impressive. <laughs> they should have taken a little lesson from him first. Um, so background- we, we grade on a scale, Mr. Iconor. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, in 2017, Council approved that the library undergo a, a facilities master plan in 2018. Uh, the master plan was to be funded by a matching grant from DOLA. Um, in May of this year, we requested an administrative planning grant from DOLA requesting $25,000 in matching funds. Uh, the $50,000 estimate was based on, uh, I reached out to a few different firms to kind of get a ballpark figure of, of what the, the cost might be and then figured, uh, you know, add a few thousand to that based on their estimates. And, and they were all, uh, as you'll see in the prices, pretty much pretty much on, on target with their original estimates. Um, so in July uh, 11th, we sent out the RFP. It closed on August 10th. We received seven, um, seven bids um, from firms, uh, four in the state of Colorado, uh, two in Texas, and one in Salt Lake uh, actually uh, requested, uh, submitted proposals. Um, I created a, a um, chart to kind of grade the, the different proposals and the, the uh, what I did was I looked at the qualifications, did the firm show extensive work in the areas of public library design, uh, did the firm provide examples of showing that they can lead a library and a community through the planning process, uh, price, and then also I, I check references, at least one reference for all companies that submitted a, a uh, proposal. Um, so from that I, I graded each um, each candidate um, with, with input from my library staff as well. Uh, they all took a look at the proposals and kind of gave me their feelings. And um, based on the grades um, from the proposals, um, the, the 
firm that I'm recommending is Humphreys Poley out of Denver. Uh, they have uh, the most extensive library, public library work out of all the firms, and, and, that what, and that's saying a lot because these are just some pretty impressive firms in, in the world of library design, which, you know, in case you're not keeping up on the world of library design, you know, I, I, I'll be happy to fill you in. Um, I'm pretty current. <laughs> I, I don't know about everyone else up here. Yeah. <laughs> We're on top of um, and so, and like I said, and, and like Phil, I did have one firm that was a bit of an outlier that came in with a, a bid that was, you know, a full $23,000 less uh, than, than the other firms. But, you know, I, I did have the other six, the other six bids were all so close together. Um, and, and in looking further into that, that lower bid, they didn't, they didn't have the experience of public library work, um, nor did they really give examples of, of leading a, commu uh, a community through the process that we want to lead them through. Much very similar to how uh, Dean and Parks and Rec is um, currently undergoing with their uh, South City Park planning project. Um, that's the kind of community involvement I'm, I'm really hoping for and I feel like this firm can really help us with that. So. Nice. All right, are there any questions? No, no I don't have any questions. No. Thank you for being thorough. Really appreciate it, Mr. Iconoy. May I have a motion? I make a motion that we award the library facility master plan bid to Humphreys, Humphreys Poli Architects at the bid price of $43,125. Second. Carlson? Aye. Levy? Aye. Noise? Aye. Keel? Aye. Lucero? Aye. Betts? Aye. Sheik? Aye. Now they're starting tomorrow. Uh, oh, well, we'll see what we can do. Yeah, <laughs> I'm excited it's to actually you guys. <laughs> oh, good. Tonight's even better. I'm still hurting. And, 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 and is there any idea as far as is how, how long we can estimate that this is going to take? It, it, it will be a 12 week project. Um, uh, that, 12 weeks 12 week, is okay. what they have uh, okay. listed in their, in their proposal. Okay. And all the firms were uh, pretty much 8 to 12 weeks. Okay. Uh, well, we'll be excited to participate in the public meetings. Yes, please. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Eric. Uh, request for a letter of support for needful provision. Have they left? Okay. Lori, I know that you've had some meetings with Dave. There have been some conversations. Is there... Are there projects that you guys are working on together, or? No. <laughs> okay. He's, he's up there from time to time, um, really Right. Well, do I have a motion? <coughs> uh, I'm kind of curious. How long ago was he here prior to January. tonight? January. Mm -hmm. January 10th, or somewhere thereabouts. What time, Jill? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let me look. <laughs> it was uh, January 9th at the workshop. Oh, you tell me. Approximately 5.30. Anyway, I, I was curious what has changed um, since then. I, I, I felt confused. The last, last time, time he was seen. asking for the formation of a local food safety but he needed, committee. He needed the same type of endorsement. He from needed the a letter. Okay. Last time he was seeking the formation, he was trying to submit it. Last time he was trying to submit eight hundred thousand dollar grant to USDA, 
and he was asking for the city to form a committee in order to enable him to obtain that grant. Now he's asking for a letter of support to obtain a $25,000 grant. And, and am I correct in remembering that both of these letters, one in January, the one he was requesting tonight, he needed them for USDA and FDA approval? I don't recall FDA, I think just USDA. Yeah, well on this you one, mentioned FDA this one's so. Musser. Yeah, he's trying, it looks like he's trying to get something from like a private grant. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a question I have. Is, has he worked with several staff members? Uh, after, the, after he first came, why there was an urban farming committee that was formed. Peyton kind of took over the, assumed the oversight position as far as the city staff person was concerned. I attended those meetings. Lori attended. Um, I think Reed was there for several of them. Um, and, and we met, we met a number of times, and then eventually kind of decided that we thought we'd gotten things kind of worked out. And I don't, beyond that, I mean, the city, the city kind of stepped back at that point and said, oh, okay, it looks like there are things in place in the community. So step up here, because I realized that I should have had you. <laughs> in order for us to record this, you have to be speaking into the mic, my apologies. Um, yeah, my recollection was that those meetings ended and that committee dissolved because there was no need for it. <laughs> that we have organizations in the community that are addressing the concerns. Right. That, that it's an urban, <coughs> an urban farming committee, you know, that's uh, <coughs> involved with city government um, is normally formed to address a need um, that's specific you know we need to you know provide food in a food <coughs> desert in our you know blighted area of town or something like that so urban farming kind of steps in to try and create some local resources to grow food within the community to provide farmers markets within the community and that type of thing but as we found after a few meetings there really wasn't a need like that and the the needs that do exist in the community are all being addressed by organizations that are that are working on those issues so I think to my recollection I think that's why the why the committee dissolved and wasn't correct me maybe maybe it's in there Jill I, I think at that time too, wasn't there a grant he was applying for yep. and there needed to be an urban farming committee That's that the city correct. in order mm -hmm. to apply for the grant? Yeah, we, we, what we did at the last, according to this journal article, <laughs> is that um, we authorized a letter of support for the grant, but that we declined to, he was looking for establishment of a committee at that point in time. And so we said, hey, uh, you know, this is kind of sprung on us. We're not in a position to do this. Um, you, Mayor, um, suggested that he submit a grant application again next year after seeking more input from local agricultural and charitable groups. The big distinction I can tell is it appears the last time he was seeking one directly from the USDA. This one appears to be from a private funding source. And it's a, it's a quite, quite significantly smaller grant. And if I recall what he said in the workshop, um, he's requesting the letter because they want to make sure it's okay that he can provide the food to the community. That's where the statement regarding um, homeless people came into play. So. Okay. All right. So may I have a motion? May I ask you a question first? Sure. Did you draft that letter? The, the proposed letter? No, he did. Okay. No, he, he, he gave us the draft. I think I would like to see more collaboration between Mr. Mr. Nettle and the hub and all the spokes you have in place now. Uh, I, 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 I know what tremendous work you're doing and I just don't think we need to duplicate a lot of these efforts. You, know, you guys have it together. You're working together and Mr. Nettles has it sounds good, you know, but um, you know, do we really need? I mean, you guys are doing a 
great job you know, you know, yeah. supplying the needs of the community. They did some yeah. If I may, um, he, um, I think he lacks the willingness to do the messy work of being in a room full of 20 people who all have opinions and want to see awesome things happen. Mm -hmm. And it takes some working through to figure out how to get there. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's more of a lone wolf um, in that respect and um, doesn't seem particularly interested in the community aspect. May I ask you a question? Do you think that, um, having heard the details of what he's requesting, a letter of support for a grant, and he's gotten approval for the local Good Samaritan Center to provide food, is there an opposition to receiving his food if it goes according to plan? Definitely not. Um, okay. But you don't need permission to do that from anybody. You can grow food and donate it to a food bank anytime. Okay. Um, so Wasn't he looking for just something from us that said we don't have an ordinance prohibiting him from doing he, that? That's what he was looking for, that's but that's, that's, that's not, he, he also stated that he needed the permission in order to be able okay. to donate food as the, well. I hey, correct me if I'm letter. wrong, but did I hear that correctly in the workshop? I think he was saying he would have to have that for the grant. The right. grant yeah, wants it was to guarantee. Grant. But I don't have any documentation from the grant except for what he's the name of it that he's provided to us. And his letter that he's asking the mayor to sign doesn't say anything about our ordinances, about whether or not we would allow it. It just says that they're asking, we're, we're supporting a grant. The proposed letter doesn't mention our ordinances at all. Yeah, there's there's just a lot of gray area that, uh, you know, I just have a lot of questions the second time around as many as the first time. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I got a lot of clarity. It felt like, to a certain extent, he mentioned a lot about Cortez being this proving ground for his grander plans in the Middle East. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, personally, I prefer uh, that. Local, um, stay local? Uh, well, yeah, yeah uh, you know. I think he's using the, the, what was important was what was going to be done for the greater Montezuma County area. Right? So yeah. I felt like that was addressed. So. Gary? Well, I just think he's using Cortez because he has access to land here and water here. So he's able to, to use that here. It's kind of my understanding on it. But I think if he had land in Utah, he would use Utah type thing. All right. Any other comments? The final comment. I just, I'm, I'm not opposed to writing a letter supporting someone else obtaining a grant from a private source. What my concern is, is with what I would almost term as the ambiguities in the letter, I'm concerned about if it's obligating the city of Cortez to something, and I don't like that. Yeah, something kind of in between the lines that yes. I'm not being about. Well, and I, and I think not being entirely forthright, he made a statement at the workshop that he was working with Lori and the co-op group, and I don't think that's the case. <laughs> okay. you know, so um, that, that's concerning. And at this time, Your Honor, uh, Your Honorable Mayor, I make a, a motion to deny issuing a letter of support for the Rural Initiative Program Greenhouse Grant for Needful Provisions, Inc., David A. Nuttall, President, on the basis of having incomplete information. A second that. Second. Lady. Aye. Keel. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Lucero. Aye. Betts. Aye. Noise. Aye. She. Aye. All right. Resolution number 20, series 2018, um, supporting amendment 73. Mr. Doherty. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Amendment 73 is a citizen's ballot initiative, number 93, known as Great Schools, Thriving Communities. This, is, uh, pr this proposal would be an increase in income taxes for 8% of the Colorado tax filers 
and it would um, <coughs> primarily hit the upper income people and C corporations while decre decreasing property taxes for businesses, business property owners, farmers and ranchers. This uh, proposed money, if, it, if this amendment passes, would support uh, mental health in the schools, safety and security, career and technical education, school maintenance and repair needs, and reducing class size. And as it's, you know, I think this is an excellent um, title for it, the great schools, thriving communities. If we don't have good schools, uh, we're not going to have a community that any business wants to come here and open up and start doing things. So I would uh, strongly ask the council to support this amendment and support our schools. Wouldn't you say this would be more like a school board? Uh, matter that they should be doing this not city council they have passed this and asked that um, more politicos get involved and support the schools if at all possible just just to give you a little history so we, we've done some of these things similarly in the past to just show support for the school district I was just curious yeah. because I've never you know yeah heard that so thank you Mm -hmm. Any questions, comments? Yeah, have any. This um, request come directly from our school board, or is this from the state? Good question. I got the resolution from the school board um, after they had passed it. Um, I believe that they it was their request that to generate support in this community. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they were well aware that I was putting this on the agenda, so. And, and there are things, if, if, if you had a chance to look at that, Ty. There, you know, I haven't had a chance to go through my Well, there, there is language in there that says, specific to, to, to our school district, that these funds will be used for oh, yeah. school got, salaries and those things. Yeah. No, I so was just it, curious if this, you know. Initiative came yeah. Colorado Board of Education instead of something that came down through our local school. Yeah, it came at the state level. Yeah. Other other questions, comments? I think it's definitely something we should, should support. Amendment seventy three. That's a motion. I make a motion that we uh, approve. Resolution number 20, series 2018, supporting Second. amendment 73. Second. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, uh. Aye. Betts? Uh, uh, aye. Levy? Aye. Noise? Aye. Lucero? Aye. Carlson? Aye. Chief? Aye. Thank you, Mr. All right. Rick, engineering for the HVAC system at the Welcome Center. We're just HVACing ourselves to death this yeah. year. <laughs> Arnold Blair, Mayor and City Council, you know you've been around too long when you replace the stuff you already put in once. So. <laughs> um, the Welcome Center has been experiencing some uh, issues with the current HVAC system. Uh, that system is nearing the end of its useful life. The uh, Welcome Center has some additional money um, in the 2018 budget um, set aside and um, this project would provide the engineering and get things ready for a possible capital project 2019. Uh, the city currently has an ongoing contract with um, ME and E out of Durango. Um, they've worked on the rec center, service center, and they just now completed the uh, Police Department building. Um, this this memo would allow extending that engineering to include the Colorado Welcome Center. They provided us with a proposed scope of work and uh, a not to exceed amount of ten thousand two hundred sixty dollars. Um, and again, that money is available in the current Welcome Center budget to cover that cost for this year. All right. Council, questions? Is this the same firm that we're having issues at the rec center with? 
Uh, it is the engineering firm that did the rec center and the police department. And I have to say that uh, due to their due diligence, we're well covered in the issue we talked about in the welcome center. We're having trouble with the general contractor, not the engineer. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay, so thank the you. The engineer's actually been Great. really stellar to work with. Those okay. guys were totally on top of stuff. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Okay. Uh -huh. if, if there are no other questions, I would like a motion. I'd like to make a motion to, consider, to approve um, engineering services with M M E and E engineering to include the Colorado Welcome Center and at the not to exceed amount of ten thousand two hundred and sixty dollars. Second. Lucero? Aye. Carlson? Aye. Keel? Aye. Betts? Aye. Noise? Aye. Lady? Aye. Chief. Aye. We have no draft resolutions or ordinances. We have no other items of business. Is there anybody that would like to risk counsel at this time? All right. There is no city attorney's report. Question mark? No, ma'am. Um, city manager. Nothing tonight, Your Honor. Okay. Okay. Um, council committee reports. Did anybody go to a meeting? Um, yes, I attended the uh, Parks and Rec Advisory Board meeting, and it was held at the site of the old high school on South Oak Street. And uh, we toured the facility, walked through the fields and we saw the demolition it's, it seems like it's going much faster than it had been for a while there uh, and uh, we discussed the park design uh, conceptual plan and several of the boards are up there uh, with the with the different uh, uh, or features that people in the community want and uh, so if you have a chance at the end of the meeting, just walk by those two boards and there's there's two different, there's plan A and plan B. So you can kind of look at the different designs. One's a, a flowing design, one's more geometric design. So we're still, you know, getting feedback from the community. You know, we're, we want, we're going to have another uh, open house. Uh, and um, so we're, we're taking into account the needs of the community and wants of the community for this new park uh, that we're proposing in south of town. So and that was basically the, the gist of the, that meeting. Uh, there's a few other things, the native plant identification signs for Hawkins Preserve and Carpenter Preserve uh, were uh, updated and, uh, and uh, reviewed for planning on Expanding the dog park uh, outside of town there uh, to increase to have a section for large dogs and small dogs to keep them separate because evidently even big really dogs and small dogs don't always get along. So, and that, that's basically the Parks and Rec committee report. Mike, are they gonna are they gonna put the those um, artist renderings of the elevations or are they gonna put them both in the rec center and the library? Is there a decision made on that? I believe so. Okay. Okay, so people can go there to look at it. All right. Anybody else that went to a meeting? See I went to the cultural center meeting also. Uh, that was held on September eighteenth and uh, as a long meeting Again, <laughs> people have a lot. Short they, they have a they have a lot on their agenda. Um, they discuss the Indian dances, um, and it, it's doing well. Uh, the September farm and ranch tour was a success. The Harvest Beer Fest was a success. Uh, Montezuma's Revenge is coming up on October thirteenth. Uh, chili cook-off. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I guess I should explain that. Yeah. <laughs> scary. Uh, we're celebrating the Day of the Dead, November 2nd. Um, Soka, uh, slightly off center. Uh, what was it, Brett? Adventures. Adventures, yes. Uh, that's November 6th to 11th, and that's been sold out. Business After Hours is November 8th. Uh, 
Did you have anything else, Brett? No. I, I had to leave the meeting early because they had another, another. Oh, we just talked about you. Thank you, Brett. That's all I have. Okay. I went to the Makeda meeting, which was on September the 18th. Um, uh, Rob Dobry is the new executive director for that organization. They are in the process of kind of revising their mission statement. It was rather interesting. They, they had several tentative um, drafts. And the one that I think we're going to go with is the one that's a sentence long, <laughs> which makes sense. Um, they're also updating their bylaws, and we're taking treasurer nominations. Um, they had developed at a previous workshop, they had developed a strategic plan, and um, um, we're working at looking at getting that put into place. There was a presentation by Nancy Zemmer, who works at um, Southwest Pueblo Community College. Uh, they have a program out there where they can do some customized job training programs. So if a business, for example, wants to do some um, training for their staff, they can contact um, the college and see about having a, obtaining a grant and, and getting a training program developed. So that certainly uh, is something that might have potential. So um, that was about it. It was, there was not a quorum, so no decisions were made. Sorry, I had quorum. No, 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 that's fine. <laughs> I, 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 I was you, so it, 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 it wasn't that you that were missing, it was all the other people that didn't come. Um, I'd just like to say Rural Philanthropy Days was last Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, we were hoping for 350, 360 people actually, it's my understanding, signed up with a waiting list. Um, it was held here in Cortez. I can't tell you how proud I am of the city. They really stepped up to the plate um, to help sponsor and, and facilitate this, this event. The majority of the venues, um, because we don't have a large event center in Cortez, we don't, don't have a place other than the high school probably that could have seated that many people or, or handled that larger crowd. So we parsed the workshops out in public in uh, city facilities and the Methodist Church stepped up to the plate and offered space um, at the church as well. Lots of, of um, just wonderful compliments. People hadn't been aware, they'd never been to Cortez before, they were amazed at our parks and what a lovely community we had and how nice everybody was. And I will tell you, the staff went ab above and beyond. Um, particularly the rec center they shut down for a day and and that staff really stepped up to the plate i don't know whether any of you happened to be in the park de vita area but the the event had a large tent set up where all the meals were served and to be there in the evening with the backdrop of the of the pond and the trees it was just it was really a lovely event so um i'm certainly hoping that we get some repeat visitors um, that want to come back now that they have a little bit more time to be able to explore the area. And um, it's our hope that we get some, some grant funding down in Southwest Colorado for some of our really deserving nonprofit programs. So it was a very successful event. Uh, the, and I just have it, and now what do I do? Here it is. <laughs> the workshop. Uh, we had a presentation by Dave Nettle, a dis discussion on marijuana stores in the city of Cortez. Uh, we tabled the discussion on loaning city equipment because we just were running behind schedule. Uh, Eric um, did a preliminary presentation on the library assessment award, and then we just had a uh, general council discussion um, about some issues with the HVAC system over at the rec center. So that was the work session. Is there, we're going to be adjourning to executive session at this point um, for the uh, conference with the city attorney for the purpose of receiving legal advice on a specific legal question under CRS section 24-6-4024B. So at this time, council will be adjourning. And then I guess we have to, do we have to come back? Yes. I mean, we're not adjourning, adjourning, but we're. We have to come back. And then we'll come back. And so um, y'all can stick around if you want to, but. Yeah.
Uh, first of all, I'd like to say congratulations to Mr. McDaniel and the school board yes. members. Yes. And thank you for being here to rep the uh, school board. Appreciate that. Thank you, Lance. Well, and I guess we should we should recognize Carter too. He's our new. Um, oh, sorry, Mr. Bobby. You as well. Thanks for being here. <laughs> also, he's, he's he's the new journal man on the job. So. All right, at this time we will adjourn to back.
The meeting is adjourned unless somebody else has something else they want to talk about. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.